Muy bien, iniciamos la conferencia magistral dando un pequeño resumen del señor Bateman. El señor Bateman, desde el año 2005, eh, es presidente, todavía sigue siendo presidente del Instituto Internacional de Manejo del Cianuro, con sede en Washington. Eh, el señor Bateman ha sido este, eh, ejecutivo senior de dos eh, eh, este, empresas en la industria minera y también ha servido como director ejecutivo del Silver Institute y presidente del Gold Institute. Eh, en los, su primeros inicios de su carrera, el señor Bateman ha servido, eh, ha sido, es, eh, digamos, ha tenido posiciones senior en varias eh, oficinas gubernamentales federales de Estados Unidos incluyendo dos, eh, eh, dos eh, de ellas relacionadas con el staff de la Casa Blanca. Él ha estado apoyando al el gobierno del señor Reagan y el primer gobierno del señor Bush. Eh, así que tiene una vasta experiencia en temas eh, de tanto también políticos. Así que aquí dejamos a Paul para que nos pueda ilustrar con su presentación. Adelante, Paul. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to be here, and I'm delighted to uh, be a participant in this uh, excellent conference. I very much want to thank the organizing committee for the invitation to be here today. Uh, they've asked me to speak about the International Cyanide Code and to give an update on its implementation around the globe. Before we talk about the Cyanide Code and its objectives that might makes sense just to spend a few minutes talking about some basics of cyanide. It's a naturally occurring uh, compound. Uh, it's found in the environment. Some 2,000 species actually produce uh, cyanide. But it's also a manufactured chemical uh, that's widely used in the production of a wide range of products today um, that are found all around us in everyday life. Um, Hydrogen cyanide is used to make sodium cyanide, which is the uh, reagent of choice in the gold sector for the recovery of gold. About 85% of all the sodium cyanide produced is used in the recovery of gold today. Um, sodium cyanide is a, a toxic chemical. It can be lethal when ingested or inhaled by humans at sufficiently high doses. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't bioaccumulate, it does, doesn't have chronic effects, but, um, and it can be treated um, uh, when someone is, uh, has ingested or inhaled it if, if treatment is quick and, and, uh, and appropriate. It's also important to understand how cyanide uh, works in the environment. Uh, it's not persistent, it doesn't uh, bioaccumulate or biomagnified, but uh, it, uh, and it does rapidly degrade, especially uh, in sunlight. But it is uh, quite toxic to aquatic organisms uh, as well as mammals and birds when, at, when found at sufficiently high levels. Cyanide is critical to the viability of the gold industry because it's the most effective and effective, most effective and economical rather um, uh, agent for the recovery of gold today. Um, there are many alternatives out there, and the industry has invested a great deal of money in looking for alternatives. But at the present, cyanide is the reagent of choice around the world. Um, it's, but it's important that cyanide be managed carefully by the industry to prevent uh, exposure to humans and to the environment. Cyanide um, is commonly found in two forms at mine sites when it's delivered. It comes in solid form. Uh, here you can see a, a bag in a box delivery. That's a one ton shipment of cyanide being received at a mine. And the other alternative is, is uh, is, is liquid form, it comes in an aqueous solution. 
In both instances, though, when it's used at a mine site, it's used in dilute concentrations, uh, generally speaking. Now, I don't need to explain it to this audience. It's well known to you, but there are big, two basic forms of uh, leaching of gold uh, used by the industry today. The first is uh, tank leaching. Where Closer, I'm sorry. This, the, this common form is tank leaching where gold uh, ground ore is introduced into a series of tanks and as it passes through, its gold is ultimately screened and recovered. The other uh, common use is heap leaching, which is well known, I believe, here in Peru, where ground ore is laid on lined pads and cyanide is uh, irrigated through the the uh, material and then cyanide percolates down and, and the gold is eventually captured uh, for processing. Cyanide, um, as we said, is toxic and it does present risks. It's the, the largest risk really in the use cycle of cyanide is the transportation of cyanide. Oftentimes the, uh, the routes for transport from the manufacturer to the mine site can be uh, hundreds if not thousands of kilometers. And sometimes the roads uh, conditions are, are difficult, uh, especially in the developing world. Um, but oftentimes we can find uh, challenging terrains as well, mountainous road passes and the like. So it's important that, uh, that the industry manage the transportation of cyanide carefully. That, that it would involve appropriate uh, route selection, but also a rigorous uh, maintenance and inspection of uh, the vehicles used to transport uh, cyanide. Also, it's important to have uh, stringent training for drivers uh, so that they know their responsibilities, but also to coordinate uh, with local law enforcement and fire brigades and emergency medical personnel so that they understand what their responses should be in the event of a cyanide uh, incident. At the mine site, uh, there are a number of risks. Uh, it would first present itself uh, during the receipt of cyanide uh, in its storage and handling, but later during the mixing phase, there's the potential for uh, releases and for that reason, it's important that uh, facilities be designed appropriately uh, so that uh, they have the right equipment, the right uh, construction materials uh, to um, prevent releases. But it's also uh, important for workers to be properly trained and properly equipped. So we want to see them in appropriate personal protective gear, full body suits, gloves, respirators, and the like to minimize um, their exposure. And finally, it's important to uh, have proper engineering of facilities so that you would have things like secondary containment so that in the event of a tank uh, having a failure that you're able to contain the cyanide at the mine site. Elsewhere on the mine, there's the, the uh, cyanide risk that you would find as exposure in the environment. So it's important for uh, piping to have secondary containment or to have pipes within pipes. Uh, it's important to have appropriate uh, site water balance uh, uh, that anticipates uh, um, special, you know, extraordinary events when you might have large rainfall. Um, it's also important to have management practices in place that will protect wildlife exposure. So things such as netting of small ponds, fencing around uh, tailings impoundments, uh, bird balls, that, which are large plastic balls that would float on the surface of, of water. And then where possible, it's important to see if you can lower the concentration levels in ponds to below 50 milligrams per liter, which is uh, the, 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 the limit that uh, below which most mammals and birds um, will not perish if they come in contact with the cyanide. In the so why do we have a cyanide code? And it's because in the late 1990s and the early part of the last uh, decade, there were a number of large-scale accidents uh, around the world. 
in both the developed and the developing worlds where cyanide uh, uh, became, um, sensitized the public to the industry's management of this uh, chemical. Um, these accidents really uh, uh, included a range of, of, uh, of characteristics, not only the transport, but also the use at the mine site as well. Uh, some of these releases included the release of reagent chemical at the Zortman Landusky mine in, in the United States and at the Omai mine in Guyana, but it also included a, a shipment to the Kumtor mine in Kyrgyzstan when a truck carrying cyanide went off a bridge and into a river, um, causing tremendous uh, environmental damage. But an important catalyst for the development of the cyanide code was this incident that you see pictured here when a small Australian mine operating in Romania had a uh, failure of their tailings facility and some 100,000 square cubic meters of cyanide bearing solution spilled into a tributary of the Danube River system. This has really caused a call for action. It really sensitized uh, not only uh, local communities, but uh, government leaders and uh, other stakeholders about the need to improve the broader gold industry's performance uh, on cyanide. So the United Nations Environment Program called together stakeholders in, in the middle of 2000 to discuss how the industry might work collectively with its stakeholders to develop a code of practice that could be applied across the broader gold industry. Uh, and ultimately, that discussion led to an agreement between the industry and its stakeholders to proceed down this path. And so the United Nations Environment Program um, appointed a committee of stakeholders to begin the work of drafting this code of best practice. This, uh, this group of stakeholders represented a, a diverse set of views and as well as geographical um, diversity as well. Mr. Benelli here, who um, I've known for 17 years, was a member of this steering committee appointed by the United Nations. And for, for about 14 months, the, the steering committee met and, and it, it consulted widely, widely with, it, with stakeholders around the globe to um, develop um, a viewpoint on how best to proceed. Ultimately, the Sinai Code was completed in, in uh, mid-2002. And, uh, and what the Sinai Code is, is it's a voluntary program of best practice. No one's compelled to uh, participate in the program. And it provides step-by-step -step guidance on how best to manage Sinai throughout its use cycle. And what makes the Sinai Code a bit unique from other management systems or certification programs is that it has a transparent certification process, which we'll discuss in a few moments. The Sinai Code scope is, uh, is uh, focused on not only gold mining companies and as well as silver mining companies now that use cyanide but also the companies that manufacture cyanide and those that transport it. And the cyanide code has a very narrow focus. It's focused on cyanide, cyanide mill tailings, and leach solutions. It, uh, it, it, it doesn't address other aspects of, of mining that might uh, be of concern to some parties. Companies that participate in the cyanide code are called signatories because they've effectively signed on to the cyanide code. And by doing so, they have agreed to implement the cyanide code program at their operations and to have those operations audited on a three-year cycle. The key objectives of the cyanide code are fairly straightforward. It's first and foremost to protect humans and, and the environment from the adverse releases of cyanide. And it's to proactively manage this across the entire supply chain. The cyanide code uh, developed by the stakeholder committee was viewed to be important. It was important for it to be able to be adapted by both small operators and large scale mines in both the developed and the developing world. 
And the Sinai Code's objective is really to be a framework of assurance for the industry to demonstrate to its stakeholders that it's, it's operating at a high level uh, of management of cyanide. And lastly, the Sinai Code objectives is for it to be a credible and verifiable system and to be dynamic over time. On that last point about being dynamic over time, we, we know that as, as time marches on, that technology and best practice will evolve, and so we expect the Sinai Code to evolve with it. Uh, one example of that right now is that we are considering um, requiring mining operators to uh, now add dye to their operations as a visual identifier so that personnel can see if there's a, a leak uh, uh, beginning in a pipe or in a tank. So this aspect of dynamicism is important to the cyanide code's long-term uh, uh, adherence. The Sinai Code structure is uh, fairly basic. It, that we have nine uh, principles that describe um, objectives that uh, adherents are expected to achieve. And then underneath those are 31 standards of practice which describe how an operator would achieve those principles. And finally, there's a verification protocol which is essentially a questionnaire used by the assessor to determine compliance with the cyanide code. The standards of practice uh, and supporting verification protocols focus on a number of areas essential to cyanide management. And these would include things such as safe, sound route selection for cyanide transport and how best to handle and store um, a cyanide at operations to prevent spill, spills and to have appropriate containment. Um, it would also speak to things such as secondary containment for high strength cyanide solutions, how best to protect wildlife uh, from interactions with cyanide, how to monitor the environment to see what's occurring out there. And a key part of the cyanide code program is the, is the emphasis on rigorous um, inspection and maintenance programs so that you can take a proactive approach to preventing releases. And finally, worker training and emergency response is essential because we recognize that from time to time there will be uh, incidents involving cyanide, that the, uh, the, the uh, challenge really is to respond rapidly and appropriately to minimize the release and any impacts that might occur. Sinai Code program is a certification program, as I mentioned, and, it, and key to it is the use of independent third-party auditors to determine compliance with the program. Uh, we have about 145 auditors that meet our strict requirements for independence, expertise, and experience um, available for selection. The individual operations that are participating in the Sinai Code they contract with the auditors for the services, and then the auditors prepare their reports and send them to us in Washington, D.C., where we review them, and, uh, and if we find them to be acceptable, we'll post a summary audit report on our website for public inspection. And it's the transparency and the of these audit results and the use of independent auditors which really make the Sinai Code stand out from other certification systems in the mining sector. Oops, I'm sorry, I skipped a slide. There are, um, there are, there's no numerical score to be had to the Sinai Code's uh, evaluation process. The auditor will go through the 31 standards of practice and make a a finding for each, and there are three possible outcomes. The finding can be made for um, it can be full compliance, substantial compliance, or non-compliance. If, if at any time in any of those standards they're, they're found to be in non-compliance, they won't be certified. If there are areas where they are substantially compliant, but those, there's no immediate risk to human health or the environment, they can be conditionally certified, and then they have to bring their operation into full compliance within one year. 
uh, our organization, the International Sinai Management Institute, does not uh, take the place of the auditor's judgment. We rely on the auditor to, to make his or her findings, and uh, it's, it, it, the responsibility sits with them. So where are we today? We started out in November of 2005 with 14 companies as our initial signatories to the Sinai Code. We've had good growth over the last uh, 12 years. We now have 195 companies participating in the Sinai Code, and their operations can be found on six continents and on 51 countries. Um, these, these companies include 47 mining companies, 23 Sinai production companies, and 125 transporters of the chemical. And collectively, they have 278 certified operations. There are another 50 or so operations that have yet to be certified, but companies are actively working towards that, that, that goal. Looking at our mining signatories, um, these companies include uh, companies that produce as little as 15,000 ounces of gold per year, up to companies that produce in excess of five million ounces. And collectively, these companies have 102 mines that are now certified, and we estimate that they produce about 53% of the world's commercial gold production by cyanidation. The cyanide code's being, a, being implemented by these companies in all kinds of conditions. You can find certified mines in the, in the Andes here in Peru at high altitudes to mines in Saudi Arabia, in the tropics, or in the far reaches of the Arctic in, in, in Russia. Um, the cyanide code is, um, is uh, being uh, 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 implemented not only by large-scale companies, but by a number of smaller companies. 24% of our participating companies are large-scale operators. Another 26% are intermediate-sized companies producing between 200,000 ounces a year to up to a million ounces a year. So this is not just a club for big companies, it's, it's open to all and it's being applied by, by many. Half of our participating companies have uh, less than 200,000 ounces of production a year or no production as some of these are companies that are just now uh, building their facilities um, for the first time to operate. This graphic here shows you the top 50 commercial gold mines um, in operation in uh, 2016. The blue bars represent companies that, uh, or operations rather, that are cyanide code participants. And at the top you can see asterisks which indicate which company, which of these operations have been certified. The 39 of the 50 top mines in the world are now cyanide uh, code participants, and we expect to see that number to grow here in the coming months based on our discussions with a number of companies. Looking at the global growth of the cyanide code, this graphic here will show you the 269 operations that were uh, certified at the, uh, at the end of 2016. Um, it's, it should be noted, though, that of these operations, 64% of them have been certified more than once. So we have many mines and production facilities that have been certified three, four, five times, which speaks to the, uh, you know, the, the efforts of these companies to maintain continuous compliance, but it also speaks to the fact that the cyanide code is a mature, established certification program now in the mining sector. The total number of certifications in our program in the past 12 years has now totaled 658. So this year we will um, receive about 105 audit reports from operations and so we'll, we'll certify about 105 this year. So we're on a, a good pace, a good momentum to continue this growth. Taking a little closer look here at Peru, uh, there are six uh, mines here in Peru that have been certified in compliance with the cyanide code. There are four certified cyanide producers and there are 29 uh, transporters. And to put this in a little perspective, Cy this, Peru has the most certified operations of any country in the world today. 
in terms of its mining certifications, it ranks number sixth in the world in terms of the number of mines behind the United States, South Africa, Australia, Ghana, and Mexico. The Sinai Code has um, uh, won the recognition of a number of institutions and bodies around the world. Uh, most notably, I think, in the year 2007, the G8 nations uh, in the communique uh, recommended that companies adopt the Sinai Code as a, as a way of demonstrating best practice uh, to their stakeholders. Um, but a number of governments as well, as well have, have uh, spoken about the need for industry to adopt the Sinai Code, whether it be Canada or Australia or South Africa. And some governments have now begun to incorporate the Sinai Code into their own regulatory schemes. Uh, most notably, that would be Ghana. Ghana has now included elements of the code into their certification, into the regulatory process as well. And of course, the Sinai Code has won the, the, the uh, support of industry organizations like the World Gold Council, which is the industry's main uh, trade group but other certification programs as well, like the Responsible Jewelry Council, which is a supply chain certification program for the jewelry sector. They incorporate the Sinai Code into their own program as well. And I should point out that lending institutions like the International Finance Corporation at the World Bank or the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which both lend to gold producers, they require Sinai code certification for their mining operations. So in a case like this, people always want to know, what's the business case for joining a certification? For, what's, what's the reason? Why should I do it? Well, one reason is, is there's still stiff opposition to cyanide in, in parts of the world. Uh, mining companies that are trying to build new projects oftentimes run into opposition about cyanide. And the cyanide code can help refocus the, 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 the discussion on performance, not on the rhetoric about cyanide. And, it, and, the, and the adoption of the cyanide code can help a company remove one obstacle in its effort to permit a new operation. Another, uh, other reasons for the business case is that the cyanide code does reduce the risks of releases that might occur. And with this will come the potential reduction of liabilities or fines that might occur should there be a loss. And accidents are less likely at certified operations. Uh, statistics will, will bear that out. And uh, those that don't adhere to best practice um, are at a higher risk for, for failure. Sinai Code provides a management system. That's really what effectively it is. And it's a management system that can be adopted for other chemical agents used at a mine site. Uh, we hear from some of the mining companies that we work with that the Sinai Code has helped change the the culture and the behavior within the company because you know, they were saying, well, why are we just focusing on this for Sinai? Why don't we do that for caustics that we might have or fuels that we might have? So the Sinai Code's begun to change how companies look at some of the dangerous goods they may have on, on site. And many mining companies use other management systems to evaluate performance, most commonly ISO 14001. And the Sinai Code can be embedded in that a review of uh, the ISO standards as well as part of a routine audit protocol. And there can be other savings found across an operation by adoption of the code. And one a good example of that is, is down in Australia at the Kalgoorlie Consolidated Gold Mines operation, a big mine in Western Australia. They found that when they started applying the code, and the code has a great emphasis on reducing the amount of cyanide used, they were able to reduce by more than 25% the amount of cyanide they were using in their operation. And that translates into big dollar savings at the, at the, at the end of the day. And, and finally, the cyanide code is really becoming the expectation of stakeholders. They're beginning to ask companies, why are you not in the cyanide code? 
but also we know from our discussions with investment banks and, and private banks that the Sinai codes becoming, and Sinai code certification is becoming a requirement of many as they consider loans to uh, mining operations. Um, and, and there are a number of sustainability indices out there that, that rank companies and their performance in environmental and social responsibility. Um, these include things like the Dow Jones Sustainability Index and the Jancy Index in Canada, which are relied upon by investment banks and professional investors to, um, to guide their, their choices on which companies they invest in. And in both of those cases, the Jancy Index and the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, they both require Sinai Code certification for the highest scores by gold mines um, as they do that. And lastly, as mining companies begin to look at uh, optimizing their portfolios and uh, begin to um, sell assets or acquire assets, Sinai Code can be used as a tool in merger and acquisition activity. Um, all the documents that pertain to the Sinai Code are available on our website, so we invite you to visit that. Um, they're available in English, Spanish, French, and Chinese. Um, one thing you may want to look at is each company that participates in our program has their own page. It will list all of their operations in the program. You can then click on and view the audit reports for each of the respective operations. And you can also click on a, a button to see who performed the audit and what that particular auditor's uh, credentials were, their experience, um, their accreditation. So we invite you to visit our website. And finally, um, uh, we would welcome your comments or questions or inquiries in the future. So my, my contact details are here. I would welcome your emails or your phone calls in the future. And so um, with that, I'll say thank you very much. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Paul. Okay, vamos a empezar con algunas preguntas. Las preguntas en, es, en, en español las voy a hacer eh, a través del micro y los señores, eh, las traductores, se la harán en inglés a Paul, quien estará escuchando. Eh, la primera pregunta dice, ¿qué se requiere para ser auditor en el Código del Cianuro? The, each audit must be led by a lead auditor, which must be a professional uh, environmental health and safety auditor that's been accredited by a uh, accreditation body um, and there's a number of them out there uh, but each audit team also generally involves uh, uh, technical auditors who must have seven years of experience uh, in the industry and in performing um, technical audits or reviews. So we want audit teams that have experience and expertise and uh, that, so that they're able to adequately evaluate the operations. Okay, gracias, uh, Paul. Uh, now I will be doing uh, the question in English. Uh, how many operations are cyanide code certified in Peru? Are you aware of any initi initiatives, initiatives on behalf of the government of Peru to include the code into Peruvian mining regulations? There are 39 certified operations in Peru, so there are uh, six mines, uh, four cyanide production facilities, and the rest are transporters, which makes Peru the largest number of company, with, a country with the largest number of certified operations. But to the point about the Peruvian government, whether it's considering the code as, as part of its regulatory process, we have had conversations in the past with um, officials here in Peru about uh, the potential that the cyanide code in, in parts might be incorporated into the regulatory a framework here. Uh, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, we're hopeful that it might be. Um, Julio might have, a, he, he's been a participant in some of these discussions as well. He might have some additional information to share. Sí, eh, quiero ampliar esta, esta respuesta 
eh, respecto al, a la inclusión de, de los aspectos del código en la, reglamentación, en la regulación peruana. Eh, en algún momento, ahora unos tres años atrás, estuve conversando, con, me consultaron algunos este, funcionarios del Ministerio de Energía y Minas para ver la inclusión de algunos este, eh, 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 de unas partes del código dentro de la regulación, de una regulación que estaban preparando. Eh, este, se hizo eso, se tenía lista casi la, la regulación y, en algún, y algún funcionario de más alto nivel este, sugirió que se, que se comparta esa, esa propuesta con otros, otros ministerios y, y ahí es donde vino el problema. ¿no? Este, hubo tantas eh, situaciones de, de cuestionamientos eh, por parte de las otras eh, entidades de gobierno que finalmente prácticamente no, no llegó a salir. ¿no? Entonces, eh, ahí quedó esta propuesta de, de este, esta regulación para incluir eh, el cianuro, digamos, como regulado. Eh, regulado ¿no? Muy bien. Eh, esta es una pregunta sumamente específica relacionada con aspectos técnicos que, este, bueno, de todas maneras se la voy a, se la voy a leer a, a Paul, en, es en castellano, ¿no? Así que este, él podría hacer algún comentario, pero es, es muy específica en términos técnicos. Dice, en el tema medioambiental, ¿qué comentarios eh, puede hacer de la bioremediación con bacterias eh, pseudomonas? ¿no? La, el señor Edgar, Edgar Taya Osorio. No sé si tenga un comentario, Paul, es muy específica la, la pregunta. Este, yo creo que de repente podrías este, hacer algún comentario escrito una vez que estés y puedas averiguar algo sobre ese tema, ¿no? ¿Te parece? Okay. It's not an issue that I have a great deal of uh, knowledge of. Um, I'm aware of it. Uh, I'd be happy to take the question and go back and talk to my colleagues and get you a satisfactory response. Sí, lo que puede hacer Paul, eh, él tiene por supuesto un gran, eh, un importante staff de consultores, puede responder, traer información para, eh, o enviar la información para aclarar estas preguntas, no técnicas, demasiado técnicas. Eh, otra pregunta también, un poco técnica, dice, ¿existen nuevos antídotos para intoxicación con cianuro que están contemplados eh, en el código? En otras, sería, en otras palabras, sería, eh, ¿existen nuevos antídotos para contrarrestar ¿no? el efecto del cianuro que están contemplados en el código del cianuro? El Cyanide Code no uh, especifica particular antidotes, it just requires that antidotes be available. Uh, we leave it up to the individual operations and uh, to decide on what's the best antidote. Uh, this also is, is something that is governed by regulations. Uh, different countries have different regulations about which antidotes are permissible to be administered uh, by personnel at mine sites. So the code leaves that to the judgment of the operations to decide. Okay, thank you. Acá hay una pregunta, no sé si te la puedo, si está, si entiendo lo que quiere decir. Dice, ¿cómo se puede fabricar cianuro de manera simple? Bueno, el cianuro tiene sus condiciones este, específicas de presión, temperatura, eh, para poder fabricarlo. ¿no? Entonces, eh, creo que ese es, la, ese es lo que se llama el estado del arte de la fabricación, que lo hemos visitado varias veces en muchas plantas que hemos visitado cuando estábamos en el código. ¿no? O sea, ahí todas las plantas empleaban la misma tecnología, ¿no? o sea, una tecnología muy parecida, en los mismos principios se, fund se fundaba. ¿no? Muy bien. Dice, el cianuro para la recuperación de oro y plata es comercial eh, actualmente. ¿Qué alternativa viable, económica y y ambiental existe a la fecha, ¿por qué no se da apoyo a ello? Well, 
There are a number of alternatives, uh, things like thiurea, thiosulfate, thiocyanate, uh, thio uh, chlorine chloride, um, mercury. There are lots of uh, alternatives to cyanide. Um, our, our job is to um, provide a framework for companies using cyanide. In time, perhaps we'll work ourselves out of a job, but uh, our job is to provide this, this framework of assurance for those companies that are using cyanide. But ultimately, there may be a shift in the industry to, to new technologies, new alternatives, uh, and that would be something that would be appropriate and uh, would be acceptable to us. Uh, perhaps we'll work ourselves out of a job. Okay, gracias. Otra pregunta de eh, el señor Félix Melgarejo, Fe, perdón, Felipe Melgarejo. Él dice, eh, eh, la voy a leer en inglés, eh, dice, In my little experience, the best way to destroy cyanide after processing minerals, mineral, in mineral operations, is eh, the, handle, the handle cyanide with caro reaction. The, the caro acid is a, yeah. is a specific. Is there other best way to destroy the cyanide? I'm not sure I'm the best person to ask. I'm not a technical person, but there are various ways to uh, destroy cyanide. The introduction of oxygen, the use of peroxide, uh, chlorine. Uh, there, are, there are things that can be used to, uh, to, 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 to you know, for cyanide destruction. Eh, otra pregunta, esta está en inglés. Dice, has the code look some measures to, I, I, Tito, no entiendo esta. That is a great question, and the, the question for those of you who might not have heard it is, is you know, uh, how uh, do you... Could you please co comment something what Tito has asked, because uh, a lot of people have not heard to the question. I think I was explaining that. I was explaining that, that, that that's a, it's a great question because it's speaking okay. to the issue of complacency in the, in the workplace, okay. And, okay. and how do you overcome complacency? And that's probably one of the biggest challenges in the management of cyanide. You know, you go along for a number of years, you don't have an incident, you don't have an accident, and you begin to kind of let your guard down, and then something might happen. Um, the cyanide code does require that each operation be recertified on a three-year cycle. And one of the things the auditor must do is look back over the prior three years to see how an operation performed during that period. Sometimes we'll find that we'll, there were, you know, things that happened that shouldn't have happened, and that's part of the, the, the process. Um, but complacency is probably one of the big challenges the industry faces. Um, I also think another challenge it faces is high turnover amongst personnel. You go to mining companies, people are constantly moving through these mining companies, and so you have the loss of institutional knowledge, you know, and that sort of thing. And, and it, different perspectives, so the company's constantly having to retrain, reorient their personnel. If the mining companies can find a better way to, to have a more stable workforce, I think that would be to their benefit in terms of managing cyanide. Um, so, thank you for that question. Okay, gracias, Paul. Acá hay eh, otra en inglés. What role is the institute playing in the control of cyanide in the illegal mining? Well, that's a very good question. We've, we've had discussions with um, uh, various parties who are looking at this question. Um, we are not taking a direct role at this point. Um, obviously, the companies that we are working with, we believe to be responsible operators. We've, that we have 25 or so uh, cyanide production companies uh, in the cyanide code, and we believe that they are selling cyanide directly to uh, primary users. Um, there may be some elements where there is some resale of cyanide um, by some distributors, but uh, 
the companies we're dealing with, we believe, have a fairly good handle on who they're selling their cyanide to. Some of the companies that we work with who are signatories to the code won't even sell cyanide uh, to non-signatory companies. That's just the, that's just the, the, the choice they've made. There's a fairly competitive market now for cyanide. There's been a number of new entrants to the market uh, in recent years. Um, and because the, because the cyanide code has um, uh, driven up, uh, driven up uh, demand uh, by some operations. I, I recently was in China visiting with a, a, a cyanide producer just two weeks ago, and I first met these folks uh, nine years ago, and they have tripled their production volume in nine years because of the cyanide code, because companies are demanding cyanide that's produced by a certified um, producer. And I should have mentioned in my talk that while we have 47 mining companies in the cyanide code, we know that our, our reach is much broader because we hear from operators in various parts of the world um, who are not part of our program but who are asking questions about how do I do this, how do I implement that, how do I meet this goal. So we know that the cyanide code is being met out there. We also know that there are a number of transporters that are certified by us who are delivering cyanide to mines that aren't, 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 are not in our program. What well, may be that those mines are just scaling up and getting ready for cyanide code participation, or it may be that some mining companies are just choosing to implement the code without going through the process of, of, of assurance, without going through the certification process. And we know from some mining companies, through their own public declarations on their websites, that they do use the cyanide code, but they have not chosen to become a signatory yet. So maybe in time we'll be able to, we'll be able to, to convince them to come and join the program. Okay, Paul. Gracias. Uh, there are two more. The next one is, does cyanide degrade exposed to ultraviolet light in tailing spawns, for example? Yes, cyanide. So the question is, is does cyanide degrade in sunlight? And yes, it does fairly rapidly. Um, so. When cyanide's in a pond and, it's in, and there's sun overhead, you can see the cyanide degrade uh, fairly quickly. Muy bien, ok. Y la última es en, está en español, es en español. Okay. Eh, en los gráficos, en los gráficos muestran cifras de certificaciones de empresas en el mundo. Pero veo que existen diferentes valores para un mismo enunciado. Ay, no sé si está claro. He's saying that there are some graphics that you presented, or you put some some numbers. Yes, I, I, one one of the graphics I showed showed the uh, number of certified operations at the end of. 2016, which I believe was 269, but that number has grown to date. So I was, I did use two different numbers. I was trying to show you where it was at the end of the year and where it is presently today. So we've had some some growth since the end of the year. Okay, Paul, uh, that's all. All the questions answered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Por favor, un fuerte aplauso para Paul. Thank you.